Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Peterson, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this online book launch sponsored by the Center for Chinese Research at the University of British Columbia. Uh, it's really fantastic to see uh, such a wonderful turnout. I believe we have more than 150 registered participants, so that's uh, really terrific. Today, uh, we're going to be discussing Dr. Dominic Yang's new book entitled The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory, and Identity in Modern Taiwan, hot off the press, published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, just a month or so ago. Uh, let me uh, begin by introducing our author and main speaker, Dr. Dominic Young, and then I'll say a few uh, brief words about the format and our panelists before we uh, get started. So Dom Dr. Dominic Mengxuan Yang is an assistant professor of East Asian history at the University of Missouri at Columbia. He completed his PhD in the Department of History at the University of British Columbia. His research focuses on the massive human exodus out of China in the mid 20th century, during and following the Chinese communist victory to places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and North America. Using this research, particularly his work on the mainlanders in Taiwan, Dominic attempts to reorient the historiography of the Chinese civil war from discussing the success and failure of two revolutionary parties to the protracted social history of mass displacement and human suffering in the war's aftermath. On the theory front, Dominic proposes a multi-event concept of trauma and memory production. This concept challenges the prevailing single event notion of trauma that originated from both early 20th century Freudian psychoanalysis, as well as Hawaxian sociological memory studies. His first book, The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory and Identity in Modern Taiwan is published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. Dominic has also published related articles in academic journals, such as China Perspectives, the Journal of Chinese Overseas, Journal of Chinese History, Historical Reflections, and Taiwan Shi Yanzhou. Dominic has been a recipient of multiple SSHRC awards, Zhang Jingguo Foundation Fellowships, and the Young Scholar Grant, the University of Texas at Austin Institute for Historical Studies Postdoctoral Award, and the Taiwan Fellowship. Dominic was recently awarded the University of Missouri Provost's Outstanding Junior Faculty Research and Creativity Creative Activity Award, the highest recognition for research at the assistant professor level at the University of Missouri. He is the first junior faculty in the Department of History to receive this recognition in the award's 20 year history. Let me uh, now say a few words about our format and uh, panelists. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Yang, who is going to introduce his book for the benefit of those of you who may not have had the chance to read it yet. And since it is in fact brand new, I suspect that may be many of you. Uh, we then have three great panelists, all of whom have worked closely with Dr. Young at various stages of his career. Dr. Diana Lowry is Professor Emerita in the Department of History at UBC and a specialist among other things of the social impacts of warfare in modern China. Dr. Josephine Cho Duke is a Professor of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia, a specialist in modern Taiwan and in the history of China. Dr. Madeline Xu is professor of Asian, uh, a professor uh, of history at the University of Texas at Austin and a specialist in Asian American history and the history of Chinese transnationalism. 
And uh, finally, my name is Glenn Peterson. I am also a professor of history in the Department of History at the University of British Columbia. And I've had the privilege of working with Dominic uh, since he first came to UBC to do his MA sometime in the early 2000s. And I was also the supervisor for his PhD thesis. So let me now turn it over to uh, Dr. Young, who's going to speak for approximately uh, 15 to 20 minutes on uh, his new book. Uh, Dominic, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peterson, for that really, really kind introduction. And I will have to say that, you know, among all the, uh, the book talks I'm doing now, this is the one that gives me the most pleasure, really to see, you know, my former teachers here and, you know, a lot of them and, you know, basically they have all, you know, sort of foster me <laughs> as, you know, that, you know, I can't be in the position I am today without them, right? So uh, I would wanna use this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to uh, each and every one of the panelists really. Uh, and of course, you know, like any good scholar, I will say, you know, what I'm, what, what I'm going to say uh, in this book and in this, um, the presentation that follows, um, it is my own work. So if there's any fault, and the fault is mine, okay, <laughs> right? Um, so I, uh, I do have some slides I want to show you guys. So I'm going to do the share screen. And I want to do, you know, it's a pretty complicated book. Uh, it's, you know, I spent 10 years on this, right? You know, we do the, uh, the PhD research for five years and then, you know, five years of rewriting, rethinking. Um, and also, especially, I want to basically um, here uh, thank Dr. Larry, especially for telling me that you should look into the trauma theory because, you know, she is the person that point me in that direction. And also, I guess, you know, Madeline Shu for, you know, getting me to UT Austin and because of this really rare opportunity of, uh, of that year, the theme of that postdoc that, I, that, that sort of she helped me sort of get, it's in, in trauma. So I get to really sort of work on um, the trauma theory and sort of, you know, working with you know, people that are in the interdisciplinary field of trauma and memory and also other historians working on other instances of trauma in world history. So uh, what a treat. Um, all right, so I'm gonna sort of, you know, get through this as, soon, as fast as I can so uh, we can get on to the discussion. All right, so um, if you, you know, so so now we're on, on share screen. If you can't see that, let me know. Um, so, all right, let's go. No, so what is the book about? Um, so, in a nutshell, it's really tracing different trauma, different traumas, and I said plural traumas of displacement uh, experienced by uh, this group of people that I study. Uh, there's about a million of them, and of course. Their, their children and grandchildren born in Taiwan, right? They're called the mainlanders. Um, of course, not, not all Chinese Civil War exiles went to Taiwan, right? But a huge number of them went to Taiwan and the ones that went to Taiwan were called the mainlanders or Wai Sheng Ren. I'll talk about that term when I, you know, the, why is it Wai Sheng Ren and not, you know, that there's, because there is this difference in translation. So it, Mainlanders are not exactly Wai Sheng right? Wai and people from, you know, outer provinces or other provinces. Um, so basically, these are Chinese Civil War exiles in Taiwan, and they're Taiwan-born descendants. I'm looking at tracing their different traumas of displacement through time, because they are, you know, in, in essence, you know, sort of exiles and rural refugees. So also, this book, you know, if... I want to sum it up, right? It's a history of mainlander trauma, and also the uh, the, the social memory productions. Now, um, I like the word social memory a little bit more than collective memory because I know collective memory is used a lot uh, in terms of like oh, because Ben, if you if you collect if you use collective memory, people will say, well, you're saying that people are thinking the same at the same time right, across the board. Uh, that's usually not the case because people's memory, they're extremely complex, right? And they all, they all have different life course. 
but you know the the idea of collective memories is that it's a social process and people at a certain point in time people from different backgrounds uh and they sort of have this kind of group identity and they all try to remember very similar things right and so memories as a social process that's you know what i meant by when i say the social production of memory um so so the from time frame is really from the moment that they left China in the mid 20th century to their homecomings. So there, there are actually two homecomings I'm talking about in the book, right? The homecomings in China after four decades and also when they got really disappointed and they, they, they sort of came back to Taiwan, but there's another shock coming, right? Taiwan's democratization and mainlanders became colonizers. You, you don't belong here also. So, what, this is why I say there are two different homecomings and two different shock or traumas of homecomings. This is in the last two sort of chapters of the book, right? And so it's about this story. Now, a little bit more on the basics of uh, mainlanders or Waisheng and people from other provinces. Um, so definition, uh, mainlanders or Waisheng refer to the roughly 1 million Chinese civil war exile who had been displayed to Taiwan before during and following the collapse of Chiang Kai-shek's regime in China and the exiles Taiwan born descendants, right? Um, although, you know, okay, I'll talk about this because, you know, not every sort of descendants of, uh, of the Chinese Civil War exile in Taiwan will say they are a Wai Shengren, or when they say themselves are Wai Shengren, there's sometimes different meanings to it, right? Um, so um, contrary to popular belief, the first generation mainlanders or, you know, this original Civil War exiles were not a homogenous population of anti-communist diehards formed by nationalist elites and lowest supporters of Chiang Kai-shek. That's, that's, that's usually the idea. Right? That these people went to Taiwan because they're either in the nationalist army or in the government, I mean, um, and they support Chiang Kai-shek. Of course, there were tens of thousands of these people. I mean, make no mistake about it, but there are actually hundreds of thousands more of just basically regular people. Um, and as I put it here, there's in fact an army of peasants and refugee students. Uh, they were dragooned by nationalist uh, military uh, during the war. Uh, these people had no prior relationship with the nationalist government. Uh, there were also dissident intellectual progressive journalists, doctors, barbers, uh, petty merchants, housewives, ordinary refugees from different walks of life who all end up on um, Taiwan. By the world, what by the world said, right? But so this is what we need to pay attention to now. Um, in early 1990s, um, and this is after Taiwan's democratization, and also with that democratization, the emergence of self-determinist self -determinist nationalism sort of separating from China, or the rise of Taiwanese consciousness, Taiwan's identity. It, it is at this moment, mainlanders or Wai uh became this sort of one of the, it's called the, one of the main ethnic groups or Zuchun in Taiwan that makes up Taiwan's new national com uh, community. And this is in the political discourse and also in the population surveys. Um, and I put it here, it is very important to recognize that due to decades of intermarriage and cohabitation in present day Taiwan, the boundaries among uh, the so-called ethnic groups are neither stable, nor are they apparent in certain situations. In fact, many Taiwan-born children and grandchildren of the now dwindling first-generation mainland exile have learned um, to speak fluent Taiwanese, you know, better than my, better than my Taiwanese or, or Minnanhua. Um, I, I came from a Taiwanese family, but my Minnanhua is really, or, or Hoklo, some, some want to call that Hoklo way. Um, it's really not 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 good. Um, some have rejected the appellation of Wai Sheng Ren um, due to uh, the political and social uh, and this is very important the political and social stigmatization that that label that ethnic label that appellation that that name of Wai Sheng Ren carries in post liberalization Taiwan as colonizer to the island's pre-1945 residents, um, as stooges of Chiang Kai-shek's authoritarian rule. <laughs> you know, it's very natural because it came over Chiang Kai-shek, right? And they, in the end, a lot of them uh, work in the government and the military. 
and also is because of their relationship with the government, because by the fact they're a displaced population, so the state needs to take care of them, right? And so then as a result, it's an award recipient of state benefit. Um, how much of that is true, how much of that is not? We can talk about it uh, later on in the discussion. Um, it, is also, it is also important to, uh, well, I can't see the word, but, you know, uh, both the, uh, the displaced nationalist leaders and the first generation exile from China had used Wai Sheng Ren not as a collective ethnic label. So there isn't this ethnic group or even a collective identity called Wai Sheng Ren before Taiwan's democratization in, in the 1990s. Uh, we need, really need a to, I, I really need to stress that point, right? The idea of, although the idea of Wai Sheng Ren or Wai Sheng Ben Sheng, uh, you know, the local province and outer outside the province, that is used in in a daily conversation. And when people say it, it, people know what it means, right? But there is not this ethnic group or a collective identity called Wai Sheng Ren. I will argue that before Taiwan democratized, um, the term was used to sort of dis dis. dis you know, it's a way of, and I, and I said this, you know, this local and other province distinction came from the idea of this uh, provincial native place or, or Jiguan in, in China. Now in Taiwan, the nationalists had reinforced this difference, particular in, particularly in official population registry. And this was done to maintain the semblance of a nation formed by people from all these provinces of China. Um, and and I, as I put it here, and this is a very important, you know, sort of point, one of the points I, I want to, it's not the main argument, but it's one of the points I want to get across in the book, is that the changing meaning of the word Wai Sheng Ren, you know, from provincial distinction in a Chinese nation to an ethnic group in the Taiwanese nation, reflects the transformation of islands, uh, Taiwan's national identity following democratization. Uh, now, so... The origins of, I, you know, I, I actually don't have time here, so I, I, I don't know how much time do I actually have. So, Dr. Pism, do you want to tell me how much time do I have left in my 15, 20 minutes? Uh, about uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Okay, that's great. I think I'm still doing good because I don't want to drag this on too long. Um, you know, so, so good. Like, you know, I, I guess we're still good in the time frame. Um, now, so, so let me talk a little bit about, you know, um, how this sort of project started. What's the question that's really driving this project, right? And it, it, is, it is the fact that, you know, when I was searching for a topic to do for my PhD thesis in which I can basically invest, you know, in the next, I know I'm gonna invest next 10 years of my time. And, and, and this was like, you know, like Dr. Peterson said, it was uh, in the sort of mid sort of mid and late uh, 2000s. And of course I went to China several times and I went to Japan even more times. And, and for most of the time, you know, when I, of course I stay in Taiwan, you know, for the longest time and most of the time uh, I was sort of searching for different topics that might interest me, right? And this, is, this thing came up in Taiwan because I found out that there's really a lot of, um, um, you know, I, I call it the post-liberalization memory boom in Taiwan with all these personal stories, oral history, right? And it's, you know, either it's by the second generation, third generation mainlanders or, or mostly by, you know, the first generation who are still surviving at a time. And, and, and they have all these stories. And of, of course, the most famous book is Long Ying Tai's Da Jiang Da Hai, the big river, big sea, 1949. I mean, maybe some of you know that book. <laughs> in fact, when I, when my, when, when, when I was writing this book, you know, one question that keep popping up is that, is this an academic version of Long Ying Tai's Da Jiang Da? <laughs> Long Ying Tai's, you know, Big River, Big Sea, 1940. Uh, and my answer has, has always been like, most definitely no. <laughs> it, it is not a, well, it is, you know, tourist, you know, there are different layers to, to my book, right? You know, at, at one layer is about, you know, the Chinese Civil War historiography and how these stories that came out of democratized Taiwan can really change it and make us think about the aftermath of the war, of the trauma and displacement that it's created. Although this is about the people in the Taiwan, but it also can apply to people in the United States, Hong Kong, and also people who are still inside China, right? I mean, think about that. And and the thing is, but um, but you know, it is 
that and 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 I think I lost my train of thought a little bit, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Back to the you know the idea that um, I was looking for a topic to do, and this really sort of uh, came to my attention, right? And it was I want to sort of you know so so if all these oral history is about you know telling this you know it's it's still it's still a very important um, story to tell, and I'm not you know and I think one point I'd like to stress is I in in no in no point in the book that I said these stories are not true. They're all true. They're all pretty traumatic, and then they are they're they're very useful as a corrective to, you know, our understanding of China, the Chinese Civil War or some, or many people like to sort of frame it as the Chinese revolution, right? <laughs> Whether it's the communist revolution or nationalist revolution, one is one is successful, the other one fail, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's also, I think it's, it's, it's much more important also to ask, why now? Why, why this story? Why this time, right? And so this is what, what they are remembering right now. This is what's important for uh, the Chinese civil, the surviving, still surviving Chinese civil war exiles and their, especially their descendants in Taiwan, born in Taiwan, try to re redefine who they are uh, after Taiwan democratized, right? But then, you know, so, so, so then the question becomes, well, what were they thinking before this? You know, and of course, I could realize there's a structural restriction, right? Because you know, when they're still under the nationalist regime, you can't really talk about um, the, the experience of 1949, and because then it's 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 talking about defeat, right? I mean, that's the most obvious answer. But then I, you know, as I my book shows, there's much more layers to it, right? And there are all these different trauma that they experience, and and way in which that they want to come to terms with. It. And in a sense that they're really remembering different sort of stories, uh, different different memories through time. I'm gonna talk about what they are and just basically these are all these contemporary memories, right? And you know, I don't know if I wanna talk about Jensen or military families village. Now we can maybe talk about that later because Jensen and you know, Jen, you know, for those of you who do not know Jensen's or or, or military families village. I, I don't like the translation the military dependence village for that's the that's the most usual translation, but I don't really like it. And I talked about why in the in the book, because you know, for the simple fact that for second generation who grew up in these villages, these are their these villages were their homes. I mean they're all demolished right now, but were their homes. They they, they grew up in it. For them, it's the feeling of home, right? So uh, family and home. So that's why I like the military families village a little bit better than all these other translations. And and but this is you know for, for the military family, this is strictly second generation uh, memory um, because the first generation sort of grew up in China, right? And and this is you know there is a reason. The reason why I pull up like Jensen memory and also. Lao Bing or the old soldier memory, old soldier literature. It's another sort of subtype of Minglander memory. The reason why I'm talking about them is that there is a historical reason why, I mean, although not all Minglanders live in Jensen, no. Not all Minglanders were Lao Bing or, or old soldiers or the low, lower class. Uh, you know, like soldier who are really pressed in the Chinese military. But there's actually a historical and somewhat of a structural reason why these two memory strain became dominant in the 1980s and laid, later contribute to, you know, this overall memory boom uh, in, in, you know, after Taiwan democratized. These came out before democratization in a limited way, but then later on, they also develop on their own and then contribute to the, the larger trauma memory surrounding 1949. Because that's, you know, for Jensen and Lao Bing, you won't have these groups if not for 1949. 1949 is the traumatic event, this cultural trauma of the mainlanders that starts everything that really defines them, right? Okay, um, I think I'm sort of running out of time a little bit, but I want to basically sort of, and so I, I have two or three slides left. This is basically to show you, you know, what the book, so, so this is the book's main argument. And the main argument is that uh, second and third generation mainlanders are now converging on this traumatic and diaspora memories uh, revolving around the great exodus from China as 
I call it in the book, collective cultural trauma as a basis for their identity formation and post-liberalization Taiwan. It is their way of becoming Taiwanese. It's a Taiwanese memory and history that's very different from other groups. That's very from the Hoklo group or the Hakka group and from the, from the indigenous people, right? Very different, but they're all, they're different, but they're also Taiwanese because history of the mainlanders in Taiwan did not start in China. It start with the great exodus, right? <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean, right? And so, so there are also the argument, you know, this subsidiary argument that I made about Chinese Civil War, historiography, we already talked about that. And if I don't want to go too much into the, uh, the, the, the theory stuff, psychoanalysis, the sociological notion, but we can also talk about that in the discussion if, you know, should the question comes up. And also I, I, I do have this point about, you know, communal reconciliation and subject position and how to really cross across different fields. So if we look at the chapter and go, I'm going to go through this really, really quickly. Um, it is here you see that, you know, because the chapters are in the books are, you know, sort of chronological, you really get to see this kind of historical transformation that I talk about, right? The reason why I made an argument that, you know, the mainlanders today, most of them second and third generation, there are now people who are producing this memory. It's a memory about their parents and grandparents coming from China and this huge uh, you know, Great Exodus was traumatic for them, but it's kind of a cultural trauma, the founding myths of the mainlander group in Taiwan, which make them different from all these other groups in Taiwan, but also from their relatives uh, in China, right? And, and so, but before that, the mainlanders will really remember different things, you know? So I, I put it here, there are all these different trauma that they experience, you know, for example, chapter one, I talked about the exodus in itself is a huge trauma. Um, and I said, there are two social traumas actually experienced, one experienced by the mainlanders. You, you, you can't forget about the local Taiwanese who were forced to receive them, right? That's also pretty traumatic. And also chapter two, it's about how to deal with that trauma of the exodus. At the time, you know, they're not remembering the exodus. Exodus is not very important. What's important for them is resistance war memory because, and for the simple fact that, you know, in the resistance war, they get to go home. So there's really, when, when there is this hope of going home and also because the resistance war was allowed because it is the right war, right? And, but the, by the time you get to the 1960s and 80s, you're dealing with what, what I hear called the diminishing hope of return because that's the time when a lot of people started to realize, like, hey, this is not the resistance war because in resistance war, we're in Chongqing for like eight years, but now it's already, already 10 years we're in Taipei. Uh, maybe we'll not, we will not go back one day, you know, you, you know like, you know, we, we have to consider that possibility. And when that sort of sink in, it was also pretty traumatic. That means they're not going to be buried with their parents and grandparents. They're not going to see the relative they left behind in China. That was extremely traumatic. And I argue that they started this movement of remembering native place and hometowns in China. So ship of memory, right? I use the word memory regime, the term memory regime to, to talk about this shift. Uh, and also they did that for 20 years and uh, boom, they can go home in the 80s, right? And, but going home was extremely traumatic because, um, you know, this is post Mao China, everything changes. Uh, you, you hardly recognize your, your, your home anymore. Uh, your, your, even your, like, your parents, if they survive or your relatives survive, they turn into completely strangers. They only want money from you. So it was extremely traumatic. That's the point they realized that the home that they've been, they've been, they've been sort of hoping and searching and longing for for like decades, that's, that, that exists only in their memory. <laughs> so they came back to Taiwan and that was also the time when Taiwan sort of democratized right in the early late 80s and early so it was in a sense a double whammy uh for first generation and the second generation although i i did i did talk about the difference between the first and the second for the second generation the the the, the impact is a lot smaller because they didn't actually live in china whatever they sort of know and remember about china it is actually from their parents memory but i guess it's it's out of all of this and when this is the time and with the democratization, when the member, when uh, the mainlanders start, and this is the second, this is a second generation thing, totally. Uh, it is the first generation being the storyteller that, you know, and, and it, it is actually the second and third generation who basically want to redefine who they, who they, because you already seen China, it's actually not home. So they want to re really redefine who they are in relationship to Taiwan and relationship to the other groups in Taiwan. And this is when this sort of, 
sort of trauma of 1949 came in. So I'm gonna so. I hope that's clear. <laughs> it's actually quite, quite difficult to summarize, you know, a book uh, in in such a short time. But I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop because I don't want to take time away from the discussion. So, um, thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, Dominic, for a really fascinating uh, introduction and overview uh, to your book. Um, our three panelists will now offer some brief comments and then we will uh, open the floor to questions. Actually, uh, if you can see the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can uh, type in your question whenever you're ready to. And um, then we'll get to them in the order in which they've uh, been submitted. So we'll start first with uh, Professor Diana Larry, uh, who will offer her comments on Dominic's book. Diana? Well, thank you very much. And let me say, Dominic, first of all, congratulations on a fantastic book. And to mention that you've now joined a distinguished group of people from graduates of the UBC History Department who've had they're not only first, but sometimes second and third books published. So congratulations on that. <laughs> I find your book terribly moving. There's so much sadness in this book and so much sense of both from the people from outside the Waisheng and from the people inside Taiwan who had to receive these um, quotes unquote visitors. But when you take that and you do it so wonderfully, you get towards the end, you realize that one of the things that they've all shown is this tremendous resilience and that they've created what amounts to a new society, which in some ways I always feel is actually much more Chinese than the Chinese society on the mainland. They've preserved much of the old while becoming, as you quite rightly point out, uh, something quite new, which is neither of the elements that they were composed of. So I want to say I, I find that very moving indeed. And I found it also desperately moving, the, the tales of the people who tried to go home. That somewhere there's a saying, you can't go home. And I think it's a song probably, which I don't know well enough. But what happened to the people who went back to the mainland in the 1980s on was very much like what happened to many of the overseas Chinese who went back to communities they'd been separated from for even longer and which they dreamt about and found just like the people who went back from the mainland. What did they find? One has to say a greedy relatives, basically, people who wanted something from them. And I remember my teacher, Jerome Chen, who'd been away from home for 40 years he came back after his first visit simply heartbroken because so many of his relatives had appeared with what amounted to um, financial demands. And um, in this case, the policies of the 1950s, because they also involved separations within China, huge amounts of people who were sent off to Xinjiang or where, uh, Heilongjiang and again were separated. So I just wanted to mention that very briefly because I think it's something that could be taken even further than just your discussion of the Taiwan instance. Then very briefly, amnesia. Somehow or other, Taiwan has gone beyond amnesia, which I'm sorry to say is a state which much of the mainland is still stuck in. And whether stuck is the right word or not, but there are the number of things that you have to be forget about in China increases rather than uh, going the other way. And finally, this is a book I've just read and I hope many of the others of you will. <clears throat> One of uh, Taiwan's greatest writers has just written a memoir which includes one volume on his um, time in uh, Taiwan as a young man, and this is by Shen Yong. It's actually a biography of his father, uh, Bai Chong Shi, but it has just this very, very wonderful descriptions of what life was like for, in his case, a family in disgrace, but nevertheless, 
not actually in jail in the 1950s and 60s before he left for America. So again, Dominic, congratulations. This is a real huge achievement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. We'll turn now to uh, Professor Josephine Cho Duke. Um, and Josephine. Thank you. Please. Well, uh, it is really a great pleasure and honor to join this occasion to celebrate and launch Professor Dominic Young's uh, first book. So, as Diana said, I'm sure you're going to have the second and the third books all along along the way. Huh? So, uh, and I'm sure Professor Glenn Peterson and Professor Diana Larry and other colleagues in the field of China studies from UBC history department are all delighted to see the publication of Dominic's book. They must also feel very proud of him uh, since Dominic's uh, intellectual journey oriented toward the original form of this book started under their guidance. So let me offer my welcome to Dominic's homecoming to the uh, University of British Columbia, even though it is on uh, cyberspace. <laughs> and uh, my hearty congratulation as well to you again for producing this uh, excellent study of uh, uh, the Chinese mainlanders 1949 great exodus in relation to trauma, memory, and uh, identity. Like my colleagues here, I also believe this book is fantastic and it has broken as a Professor Madeline Xu uh, has uh, praised in her uh, earlier comments about your uh, a book, uh, this book has broken new ground and made significant contribution to our understanding of this topic. This is not just because scholars have rarely examined this subject or just because Dominic investigates this subject from the perspective of social and the cultural trauma but it is really more because through Dominic's investigation of these two kinds of trauma, he was able to map out the long and the winding process where the Chinese mainlanders self-asserted Taiwanese identity finally emerged. Throughout Dominic's book, he discusses how the 1949 exodus play the central role in the conceptualization of those diasporic Chinese mainlanders, and especially of their descendants about their own situation and their own selves. In other words, Dominic discusses how this exodus, as time went by, became part of what he calls the mnemonic regime for the Chinese mainlanders to produce their social memory, as Dominic just mentioned a while ago. And yet, Dominic reminds us that after drastic changes took place in different time periods and on both sides of the Taiwan Strait, this memory production no longer served to evoke nostalgia for their original home on the mainland, but actually became tied to their realization that their home is not there, but is here in the democratic Taiwan. Such a discovery by Dominic undoubtedly reveals a crucial element in the social cohesion of today's Taiwan. That is the power of liberal democracy. And such a discovery should also be relevant to our understanding of any democratic society, including Canada, that is constituted fundamentally by immigrants. 
Another point I want to make is that since Dominic's study is no longer centered on the conventional question of who lost China after the civil war between the nationalist and the communist regimes in 1949, his study actually brings us back to the crucial issue of all historical research. That is back to the study of people and their conditions in different times and different places. Even though Dominic's study inevitably touches on the pain and the suffering of both the Chinese mainlanders who were forced into exile to Taiwan and the impact of their arrival on the native Taiwanese on the island. I, however, see Dominic's study of this complex history as a story of triumph. Triumph not only of those two groups of people in Taiwan, but also of every citizen of people in Taiwan today and specifically for Taiwan's successful transformation from an authoritarian system to a new democracy. Because without the 1949 great exodus, the 1 million Chinese mainlanders might very likely have suffered even more or even lost their lives under the extreme form of Mao Zedong's socialist regime. Moreover, the cunning of history is such that one can never be sure about whether or not Taiwan would have developed into a new democracy if the exodus had never taken place. And yet, because this great exodus did take place, and also did bring about all the ensuing historical changes to the people on the island and to Taiwan itself. We can now actually gather here to celebrate the launch of Dominic's book and also discuss Taiwan's remarkable achievements as the only successful democracy in greater Chinese language speaking world. And this is even more so if we consider that freedom in Hong Kong today is hanging by a very weak thread. Finally, I will say that this story of triumph belongs to Dominic because without his quote unquote multi-directional empathetic unsettlements of this long and tortuous history, the picture of this history would remain ambiguous and incomplete. And I must also emphasize, it is truly admirable that Dominic has transcended the tragic fate of his family elders under the nationalist regime's infamous February 28th massacre and has in the end completed the study of the Chinese mainlanders history with empathy, but also with critical distance. On that note, I offer my recommendation of this path-breaking book to everyone here and my congratulations to Dominic Yu again for transforming yourself from an angry young student of history back decades ago to a genuine historian in its most true sense. Thank you, Dominic and everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Cho Duke for those very uh, trenchant and powerful comments. Um, 
Now, we like to uh, claim Dominic as our own here at UBC, but uh, in fact, much of the uh, intellectual work and rethinking that was involved in turning Dominic's dissertation into a book, the book that it has become, took place at the University of Texas at Austin under the uh, direction of Professor Madeline Shu. So now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Madeline to offer uh, her comments. Madeline? Well, thank you, Glenn, for that kind introduction. And I'm so happy to be able to participate on in this occasion celebrating Dominic's accomplishment. Um, the one of the thoughts I had reading the published version was that um, for a uh, book that doesn't have diaspora in its title, he sure talks about diaspora and diasporic uh, migrations and experiences a lot with considerable nuance and uh, complexity. And I, I actually applaud his restraint because um, what he has done in this book is actually far more ambitious. And so I will say that, you know, Dominic came to the University of Texas as a postdoctoral fellow with a massive, massive, messy manuscript. And, you know, and he took his time and he took risks and he undertook to um, learn from my colleagues. So a lot of the sort of the insights and the reframing of his project really benefited from um, some of my, you know, really great colleagues at UT, uh, Tracy Matisic, um, Ben Brower, Yoav de Capua. And, you know, and a lot of times you have a junior scholar and I will confess to being a little frustrated because I'm like, Dominic, get your book together, uh, send it to the publishers and publish it. But, you know, but Dominic really, you know, was, eager to come up with a more sophisticated and I think importantly new uh, way of thinking about um, Chinese migrants, um, Chinese overseas and this uh, historical era. And, you know, and so um, it, I, I think he really was in many ways a model postdoctoral fellow in that he really took up the opportunity of uh, coming to University of Texas and learning from his uh, his, uh, his fellows at the Institute for Historical Society, but then also learning from um, the faculty um, uh, in my department. And so, and I think it is reflected in the uh, sort of the sophistication and the, um, and I think the scope um, and ambition of the book that he's published. And so in resisting the allure of diaspora, which is very hard for people who work on migration, um, he puts, um, uh, the, the sort of scholarship around trauma and social memory. Um, and he puts the field of Chinese studies into conversation, um, I think with a broader scholarship. And so I think he um, has taken uh, Chinese migration, um, sort of uh, the study of Taiwanese history um, and really I think given it a broader audience because of his um, uh, conceptual boldness. Uh, so, um, very excited, um, very pleased um, that this is, you know, has come into, um, you know, come into the world uh, in the form that it has taken. Um, so I just had uh, some, a couple of substantive thoughts about um, the, uh, the, the, the book itself. And one is that I was thinking about it as, um, you know, one of the big I mean, another reason why it is such an important contribution is it really uh, presents a social history of this very messy set of experiences of a group that we have called Huayshanin, uh, and so the, the, the mainlanders. And one of the um, uh, questions, right, is why has this group not been discussed before? And um, as he notes that there were many political reasons, um, I, it also reminded me of, um, uh, Chen Wangxing's uh, call to action to try to uh, dismantle the ways in which the Cold War in Asia, in fact, has interfered with processes of decolonization. And, you know, and you know, looking, reading through um, uh, uh, Dominic's really wonderful descriptions of these different phases and the ways in which uh, this mainlander population were reshifting their um, uh, sense of themselves, sense of their 
uh, place in the world. Um, it made me think of uh, Taiwan as experiencing a delayed decolonization that doesn't become possible until after, really after 1979, when Chiang Kai-shek is no longer, um, uh, well, he's passed away, but uh, Taiwan is no longer positioned to uh, pretend to be the real China. And as long as there was uh, that political situation due to the Cold War and US support, the mainlanders could not in fact be understood as you know, what they were, this refugee, this exiled population that was struggled because for political reasons, they had to be understood as uh, bolstering the legitimacy of the Chiang family uh, and Taiwan in terms of representing the real China, which then required, and what the US hoped to accomplish was that uh, Taiwan would be seen as um, the magnet for the loyalties of Chinese overseas. And it's only after um, that position is uh, sort of is uh, no longer required that we can then have uh, perhaps more of a view, uh, attempt to have insights into the actual sort of complexities of what was uh, happening with the mainland of population. Um, another uh, thought I had was that um, they are often not thought of in terms of being refugees, right? And then of course this uh, uh, brings us into conversation with uh, Dominic's classmate, Laura Matacoral's work on um, um, uh, refugees um, after uh, World War II. Um, and one of the problems, and this here I'm speaking as a migration studies scholar, is that um, uh, categorically, as Laura argues, um, Chinese were not considered refugees because then that would have required them to uh, gain consideration under the emerging system of human rights um, and um, which then uh, demands uh, rights to immigration and resettlement elsewhere. The problem was that uh, in the case of Chinese, um, white settler societies did not want to have to welcome them, right? And so the refugee uh, policies primarily benefited uh, European refugees, but Chinese had to be um, located elsewhere. Although since it was the Cold War, you couldn't force them back to China. And what happens is you ended up with places like Hong Kong and Taiwan being the repository for um, millions of uh, displaced ethnic Chinese. And of course, we know um, Chinese, actually, it's a tremendous story of triumph, right, and success because the Chinese in Hong Kong, the Chinese in Taiwan, um, actually we made new lives. They, in fact, made very um, sort of uh, highly successful, what is it, the term was tiger economies, right, and so became advanced economies, also became um, highly democratic societies, Sinophone societies, and although this, this, these triumphs, this success, um, is very much in a shadow now in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan stands as a remarkable accomplishment um, with you know, considerable contribution from the mainlanders who have um, been finding their place in Taiwan. Which brings me to my sort of last comment and a question actually for Dominic. So one of the things that struck me about sort of uh, Dominic as a Benzhenren as a, as, as a Taiwanese studying the Waishengren, the mainlanders, is that he brings to it a insider, outsider uh, kind of um, positionality. So he is an insider to Taiwan, right? Because he is Taiwanese, um, but he is an outsider uh, to the Waishengren in many ways. And so my question um, contains two parts. One is, how do you think, do you think a Waishengren undertaking the same project would have the same insights? Would they be able to sort of be able to scrutinize themselves, their sort of their histories in the same way as um, you are able to as an outsider, right? And then the other question I have, or just it's just to ask you to comment is that in this book, you're attempting reconciliation. You are seeking to sort of um, uh, deal with a difficult and a painful past. Your family history is very much sort of 
you, I mean, you have a personal stake in this, which then means that you have a lot of advantages, right, as an outsider in presenting this kind of narrative and interpretation and basically a pitch for acceptance and empathy. Um, anyway, so those were just areas in which I'd love to hear your thoughts and responses. And thank you, it's a great book. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madeline, and thank you to all of the uh, panelists for their comments. Um, I see the questions are racking up. We now have uh, 10. Dominic, before we go to the questions from the audience, did you want to, uh, did you want to uh, address uh, Madeline's questions? Um, yeah, if, if I can do so very briefly, uh, you know, Thank you very much, you know, for all the comments. I, uh, like, like I said, I have to stress again, it is really, so all the people who are here were there or are still very important, you know, for me, for my intellectual development, continue intellectual development and as an inspiration, right? So I really appreciate all the comments. Um, there are, there are gold, <laughs> there are gold to me. You know, I, will, I will remember this <laughs> moment. <laughs> you know, for, you know, for, for the, for the, for the conversation I have with, you know, sort of Glenn on this numerous time and went with Diana Larry in the hallways and also from time to time insight from Dr. Chu Duke. So like, I, I would just want to say like my time in UBC, um, it is immeasurable towards uh, the making of this project. And also my my one year or nine months at UT Austin with, with Madeline. <laughs> yeah, I mean Madeline, you are first of all, the thing is um, diaspora. That's in the original title. The original title is the Great Exodus from China: Trauma, Memory of Diaspora and Mainlander Identity. The Cambridge editor <laughs> insists that I take diaspora out. <laughs> she insists. I just want you to know that. I mean, so, and, and for you know, people who are sitting here who have written the book, you'll know this battle with your your editor, right? In terms of so, and and th this idea of sort of uh, the issue of positionality of this sort of complexity um, with the question that you know, yes, I mean, so would it be? I would argue that, you know, if it's because when I met uh, my, because I, I do have my other mentors in Taiwan, the scholars in academia, Seneca, especially Zhang Wokui, Wang Fu Chang, especially Zhang Wokui, who introduced me to Mainlander Studies, right? Do you know the first thing when I decided I want to do this topic? Because Zhang Wokui, this sociologist, and he's now retired from academia, from his place in in, in Academia Seneca, if I'm from, from his position in a Academia Seneca, uh, he's the second generation mainlanders. He's, you know, people call him the father or the founders of the mainlander studies in Taiwan. One of the first things when we we're discussing this, when I, one of the first things I said to him is that, look, um, I am a Taiwanese and I'm not only a, pe a person of Taiwanese descent, although I, you know, my family went to Canada when I was 13, 14. So I don't know a lot of this. I don't even know that much about Taiwan history. I mean, seriously. Um, so everything is new for me. But I did come to realization of my family trauma. And I told him that, look, uh, I know you want reconciliation. But what I, what I see is the fact that you have, you know, 90% of the people in Taiwan that are working on mainlander history, like publishing all these oral history volumes, right? They're mainly the descendants of mainlanders. Uh, and you do have all these study of Jensen and all of that. And I said, but we, we have very small number of Taiwanese that are actually doing mainlander trauma and, and vice versa, and vice versa. You have Taiwanese doing the, like I, I work on the 228 incident for my MA thesis. I think Glenn <laughs> supervised that <laughs> as well. Right, and I said to Mogwe, if we are going to have some kind of um, reconciliation, we got to have people coming across, you know, different like borders, and you know, and and you see, I had I have some debate with other scholars who are actually, you know, sort of, and 
uh, from other disciplines because there are other disciplines that are not really into collective identity. And they told me that this idea of collective ethnic identity is this sort of a myth. Right? And you know, you, like, like mainlanders today, Taiwanese today, or indigenous people, what, what are the differences? Hakka, Hoklao, there are no differences. But I said, look, uh, I'm not, the, the, the kind of border I'm talking about the kind of communities I'm talking about are not ethnic identities because you could be, you know, born a mainlander person, but you, but your your historical memory and if your idea of your family history or where Taiwan should be, your idea about Chinese culture, whether it should be unification with China, all that stuff could be very different. I'm I'm saying that, you know, the the, the kind of borders I try to get people to cross there is, is the borders formed by memory, memory communities mnemonic communities and these mnemonic communities have you know real sort of consequences because there are strong emotion that could, could be sort of whipped up in, into some kind of political and, and social conflict and and certainly you know when i started this project in, in taiwan in the late um mm -hmm. 2000 that was extremely obvious so I guess, thank you for asking that question and for me to sort of, and, and I would say that I know I might, I might be sort of deflecting it is, I would argue that it will be just, you know, by the simple fact that I came from sort of an outside position, you know, as, as Madeline said, you know, I, you know, I, I, I did, you know, come to study the history of Taiwan from the uh, from the Taiwanese side, you know, that, that kind of, and the Taiwanese side certainly have their own trauma, right? But when I, and, and one of the writing strategy, um, and and this is very early. I think people who, who are online, oh, Dr. Cheek is here. I just realized that, <laughs> and Dr. Cheek was also on the, the thesis committee at the very end, right? And I think, I, I guess you know, you know, uh, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Cheek. I mean, you know what? And 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 Dr. Chutu was there. I, I think one of the the question that came up when this was still at dissertation stage is that. Yeah, that is this intentional, this kind of writing strategy, um, just to really talk about your family background in the end. And I, I think for me, that's 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 my strategy. I, I want my reader to see that this is you know a serious historical work. It's pretty empirical. Uh, there's a lot of things that put into this research, and also this idea. And this goes back to Dr. Larry's. I you know he her 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 sort of argument and her comment when reading when reading this book, this this idea of empathy, these are real people and these are stories. And, and so in my writing strategy, I always try to show that, you know, the give these people humanity. I mean, and so I was really happy to get Dr. Lowry's comment because you know, that means I'm I'm successful. I'm I'm putting a human face on on these refugees, right? And and that but all that strategy of, of creating empathy. On, it is to bring the audience to the end and give them this really big surprise in the end. Like, look, this is written by a person or descendants of these person who really should hate these people. And if that's and, and for me that uh, I said it as a strategy, but there's some nothing disingenuous about it. It was the writing process. It was extremely difficult. I mean, there were times when I when I first got to UT Austin and Madeline was there and there were times Madeline asked me like, how's your progress? I was kind of like, ah, oh, no, not too good. Didn't write anything. I remember Madeline's face and she was like, what you say? <laughs> you know, why? And, and like, you know, there's some tension, right? And then at the time it was really difficult for me to tell Madeline all of this because I was still trying to sort of struggle, struggling, sorting out this feeling of writing stories of, of, of empathy about people that I should have negative feelings about, and 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 this this sort of kind of crisis in in, my, in, in their self and how to basically sort of and and this is you know you know and and I, I'm I'm really happy for Malin to to ask these questions for me to really talk about these you know how this is maybe I should, this maybe you know, the way the, should be the way in which I shape this discussion. But anyway, um, yeah, that, that's that's my answer. I'm, I'm not going to drag on anymore because I think there are, there are a lot more questions coming, right? So, but thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Glenn, you have to talk. Yeah, uh, let's, um, let's go now to some of the questions from the audience. Um, and... Um, 
Start with the first one from Rosita. Professor Young, thank you so much for this study and the resulting book. My question is, is there a parallel development in terms of trauma and memory among the exodus of mainland people to Hong Kong? Are you aware of studies that are done with this population? Um, uh, do I just answer, so you, or you yeah. want to collect a couple more questions? Uh, like um, two or three okay, let me, uh, let me uh, go through two more. Okay. Uh, the second one is from Joshua Tan. Uh, how did you decide on the great exodus, exodus in quotation marks in the title? Were there any alternatives you were deliberating, such as exile, migration, diaspora, or others? And the third question uh, is from Henok. Professor Yang, the Waishang Ren tend to be more pro Taiwan. Do the, do the Waishang Ren tend to be more pro Taiwanese independence, or do they envision a peaceful Chinese reunification? Okay, okay those, are really <laughs> those are really good questions. Those are really good questions. You know, for for the first question, let me see. Uh, I think I miss it. What's the? Oh, um, sorry. I think I, I was pulling up something on the. Oh, they will also be in the chat. Oh, okay. So, and they're in the order, right? Because I mm -hmm. want to see. Yes, third order. order from the first order one was Rosita. Yeah, Rosita. Okay, I'm trying to. Ooh, but I don't see it. Um, if you go to Q and A, the first question. Sorry, I was looking at you know stuff, and then I just lost the uh, the uh, the 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 discussion thread. So, could oh. you uh, repeat the first question again? Yeah, maybe it's yeah. not a good idea. Okay. Um, it's also it's also currently at the top of the list uh, under the Q and A tab, but here oh, it is. I remember it's about Hong Kong. Uh, okay, yes, sorry, exactly. I remember now. That's right. it, it is about Hong Kong. Yes, um, is there a parallel development. There, there, I think a study that you know that I know of is my my classmate Laura Macadoro, and it is the the book that uh, Melanie Shu just mentioned earlier. Um, so. But you know, I actually wrote a book review on that, <laughs> on, on you know, on Laura's book, and I said uh, she should talk more, a little bit more from from the migrants' perspective, right? So, um, the the short answer is that yes, there there are books out there like Laura's book that talks about even you know, Glenn, um, you do research on the uh, the post 1949 uh, migrations to Hong Kong, right? Uh, but a lot of the work in this area has been sort of more sort of policy study oriented, looking at the archives. And, and I guess, you know, the reason why there aren't that many, that really sort of, uh, it, it's that you, you can see how different sort of dynamics of where Taiwan and Hong Kong develop really shape the historiography of it, right? So, I mean, um, I guess the short answer is there are, and if you want to, you know, look at it, you, you can look at Laura Macadoro's book. Uh, but in terms, and I myself, I worked on, I published, I think Madeline also published on, um, you know, the RC, right? Madeline wrote a, an article or, uh, and also a book chapter on RC, the, uh, the A Chinese uh, Intellectual INC, which is all like, you know, post-1949 Hong Kong refugee. So there are works out there. Um, that you know speaks to the same kind of displacement. Not 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 too much about sort of trauma. That that was always in the background. Like there was sort of yeah, it's pretty traumatic for any population to to leave home uh, under duress. So then, what is the uh, the second question? So the uh, second was... question is Joshua mm -hmm. Tan. How did you mm -hmm. decide on the Great Exodus? In the title. Oh, the, uh, yeah, in the, you know, so, you know, Joshua is absolutely right. There are, you know, several choices that I was, like the great exodus, that that was sort of in the, uh, in my dissertation, right, the dissertation state, it was already the great exodus. Um, because, and this is really funny, because at the very beginning, 
um, I was sort of working on, you know, this group of people as a form of Chinese diaspora, right? So, and of course, I later move away from that argument because I think, you know, for if if you want, you know, more of these details, theoretical discussion, you can check chapter one of the book when why I think that you know, the mainlanders are diasporic in a sense, they're, they're displaced people, right? They're refugees. But in terms of calling them diaspora, it's because when they came into Taiwan at the same time, they're actually this sort of dominating force collectively for the local population. They came with the military sort of, um, sort of authoritarian regime and their, it is actually their culture and their language, their, their speaking language that the local people need to adopt to, not the other way around. So that makes them really, really different from other sort of what we call dias uh, diaspora population around the world. And that's the reason. And and so, but but it is really funny because at the very beginning, I was thinking about diaspora, uh, 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 implementing the theory of diaspora using the word diaspora in my in my dissertation and later in the book. So th that's why I choose this title of the Great Exodus <laughs> instead of the exiles, instead of refugees, instead of anything else. But in the end, although I sort of uh, move on to trauma and memory, which I think it's a much more, uh, you know, sort of fitting theoretical framework to discuss this entire historical experience. But I, 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 I kept <laughs> the Great Exodus because it just has you know, a, a really nice sort of sound to it. Of course, now it's great exodus from China. <laughs> the, my, my, my editor tried to sort of get me to change the great Chinese exodus. That was the suggestion. I said, no, definitely not the great China because these people in the end, they, they became more like Taiwanese. <laughs> there are a Chinese population, Chinese speaking population, Sino-Frome population, like all population in Taiwan. But I think it's problematic to call them Chinese exodus. But if it's great exodus from China, of course, because that's a geo China is a geographical location, right? Um, and so, yeah. So, what's the third question about? I mean, I mean, sorry, guys, because the reason why I have to, you know, ask the Glenn to remind me is that I thought I can saw, I can see them in order, but. I don't know why, like in my screen, they are really not in the order that was sort of said. Anyway, so Glenn, what's the next uh, question? Yes, okay, so the, uh, the next question is, uh, Professor Yang, uh, do the Waishang Ren tend to be more pro-Taiwanese independence or do they envision a peaceful reunification with the mainland? Yes, yes, the question. That's a very complicated question. And sorry guys, I, I, I I, I apologize for this short memory because you know this question should have come up. It's a very important question. It's the the most frequent question people ask me at these talks, right? And and the thing is, I would say that because you know, um, because a lot of mainlanders, you know, especially the older ones, uh, you know, the first generation that are still surviving, some of them especially those in the politics are very vocal about unification with China. And you do also have mainlanders uh, who went to China and sort of, um, and sort of form political parties or, you know, that advocate for unification. And these are, these people are very vocal, right? So we tend to, to, to get this impression that, you know, in this, that main, mainlanders in general and also Taiwan born mainlanders want a unification with China. I mean, my book, you know, you know, my entire book is show that that's not entirely true. In fact, that, you know, a majority of the mainlanders and the majority of the mainlanders today are formed by Taiwan born mainlanders, right? They are actually, they have their own history and their own identity as, you know, both Chinese and Taiwanese, but I argue that they're they're much more Taiwanese because they, by the fact that they're born in, in, in Taiwan, right? And they're sort of creating this history for themselves as part of Taiwan. And of course, in terms of, if, if you want to talk about the survey numbers, right? Yeah, you know, if you look at, there is a difference between the Taiwanese population and the mainlander population when it comes to like supporting, you know, unification or, uh, or, or or say that I'm both Taiwan, I'm both Taiwanese and Chinese. There is a higher percentage of mainland population in both categories. That is true, 
But if you have been following those trends, those trends are really going down, going down and going down. And, 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 and to now that people that really would argue for, for, you know, whether they're Taiwanese or mainlanders, they're people who are really going to say that they are Chinese just by the so different, so identification of Chinese and then have want to have absolute, like the, the, the unification in China is the absolute only way this group of people comprise such a small percentage of the Taiwanese population right now, regardless of who they are, which group they belong to, right? <laughs> Maybe like less than 5%. So yeah, there you go. I mean, so I, I guess, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a question that, you know, I, I hope that I, you know, help answer. So, right, Glenn, what's the, uh, the next question? Okay, our uh, next question is from Daniel Anaforian, and he would mm -hmm. like to know, do you foresee some of these same traumas occurring today as more Hong Kongers are moving to Taiwan following the new national security law in Hong Kong? Is there something different at play today? Um... So I'm a historian to study the past, and uh, I'm not going to basically homogenize every instance of of of, of displacement, right? Um, but I would sort of say that you know, any time when you have you know, for political reasons, for the the idea of fear of being persecuted, uh, involuntary movement, you're going to have some kind of displacement, and that's pretty traumatic, right? Um, and so although I would want to sort of reframe from saying that, yeah, it's going to be very similar. And because, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a very fun experience, it, you know, experience to, to go through these experiences. And I, I really feel for, you know, people like Hong Kongers who are, I think a number of them are coming to Taiwan a number of them are, you know, now trying to move to like UK, Australia, and maybe Canada. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, I would say that, you know, the, I mean, it is a topic that I, I personally would want to basically investigate, although it is something that's pretty recent, right? And it is, again, um, this is still the situation is still developing. It remains to be seen. But if you want me to venture a guess, I will say that there will be very similar mode of trauma and memory. I will, they'll develop, you know, nostalgia for the, for the, if they couldn't return, you know, then they will, they will basically try to recreate, re, sort of recreate what they, what they used to have in Hong Kong and Taiwan, but it's never going to be the same, right? And so, yeah, I mean, like, like, like I said, I feel for the people of Hong Kong. I really feel for the people of Hong Kong. All right. So the next question, I, I actually can see now because without, um, uh, it's not being deleted. So it's the next. So hello, uh, Dr. Liu Xin. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's the next one from uh, Atian. Uh, no, there's one before that by Jeff Luo. Can you see that one? Okay, okay, I, I see I see that now. I'd like to ask if the feeling of nostalgia to return home was a unique case that developed in Taiwan only, or did it apply to overseas uh, Chinese populations since seeing home was so far away from them? And I, I think, you know, this, you know, Professor Peterson and Madeline Shu, you're all, you know, Chinese migration specialists, you know, probably you can answer this question better than I am. But if you want to ask me, I'll say, yeah, I mean, this sort of feeling of nostalgia to return. I mean, there are different forms of nostalgia and different degrees of nostalgia. Right? And I would sort of argue that, you know, sometimes maybe the, you know, distance it is like the more fur away from home, uh, the, and, and the more inaccessible that that, that home is, usually uh, your feeling of nostalgia will be stronger or it will be in a more intense form, right? And also the, the inability to basically make contact. I think that's one of the things that if you want to talk about, you know, the mainlanders in comparison to other 
um, sort of diasporic groups, or it is that you know that if you if, if you compare them to let's say uh, Chinese Americans or over, uh, Chinese overseas uh, in uh, in the United States who are building railways, and if this is uh, Melvin's specialty with her book on San Francisco. Uh, Chinese is that, you know, of course, the home is very far away. It's really hard to get in touch. You know, the message, messaging, sending a message and money takes like months, you know, given that time. But if you compare them to the mainlanders in Taiwan, it's like for the longest time, there's really no news. And with all, and, and not only that there's no news, you're, you're, you're forbidden to contact with your relative over there. You don't know what's going on. And there's, you know, constant nationalist propaganda on the other hand, telling you that Mao had basically turned China into hell on earth. You didn't know if that's true or not, but that's what you're told. Like, you know, so many people die and we're so, you, you can, if you, if you can picture yourself in that position, right? You'll see that first of all, there are different sort of modes of nostalgia, right? <laughs> people can get really, sometimes I don't like the word nostalgia because people can get nostalgic, you know, just for no reason, <laughs> like you know, the good old days. I mean, these are romantic, you know, things about the past. I mean, those nostalgia are very different from nostalgia people were replaced, it were, were basically displaced, right? And also very different from people who were displaced but have basically no contact whatsoever. And this is why I I, I sort of, I sort of keep talking about trauma, 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 trauma in this, in this book because it is trauma. Um, okay, so the next one will be Atian Sven, right? Hi, Professor Yang. May I ask why Weisheng and Taiwanese or, or they're just citizens of ROC? Do you have any comments on how the complex of native place, hard to find in English term Shang Jiping, among Weisheng and still continue in Taiwan today uh, to the continual issue regarding the group antagonism between uh, Weisheng and native Taiwanese? Now, I think I've sort of answered this question a little bit earlier. Um, of course, there there's some 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 degree of continuation between um, this sort of shengjie shengjie qingjie, which is you know provincial sentiments, and also you know got translated to this group between, uh, because it's interesting when you talk about shengjie qingjie uh, provincial um, sentiments, it, you know back in the days I'm talking about before democratization, especially in the 1950s and 60s, it's not only between the mainlanders and the Taiwanese, Weisheng and Bensheng. It's also between like people from different provinces of China. <laughs> like, you know, people from Guangdong will be not so happy with people in Sichuan. I mean, sometimes, you know, when we sort of look at the map of ethnicity or, or, or this sort of uh, map of different mnemonic communities right now in contemporary Taiwan, we lose sight of what, what, what it was like you know, in the 1950s and 60s were totally different. So um, this idea of Shengji Qingjie, I think that's pretty interesting. You have to really take that into account, right? And also about the ethnic tension. I would say that the ethnic tension in Taiwan today, nowadays has basically sort of subsided a little, a little bit. People, you know, don't think of, like different ethnic groups don't think of each other as absolute sort of, uh, like I said, the boundary itself is not, it, it's quite porous. It's not so, you know, it's not so absolute and, and tense nowadays. But the thing is that it, if you, but I think you have to consider another thing. This is what, I, what, I, what I've been talking about. We have people with different memories, different interpretation of history, positive views of the nationalists, negative view of the nationalists, positive view of Chiang Kai-shek, negative view of Chiang Kai-shek. And sometimes those go across provincial borders. You have a lot of Taiwanese who are supporters of the old nationalist regime in Taiwan today. And a lot of them are called Han Fen. <laughs> they, are, they support Han Guoyu, right? And they're Taiwanese. Right, so I, I think this, you know, I think ethnic conflict and ethnicity doesn't really explain everything about, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, these like conflicts and tensions. And I think it's better, it would be better if we were able to look at it from, from what I propose, which is from different memory communities or different mnemonic communities. Okay, 
And so thank you so much for speaking, recognize you are a historian. So your outlook is different, but how does this trauma manifest itself in Taiwan today? And how salient is this identity? So what you're talking, if you're talking about today's trauma, right, Daniel, so that's uh, in response to Daniel, um, I don't know what trauma score you're talking about. For me, there are two big, two main differences in, in you know, how scholars understanding trauma, the sociological school and, and sort of psychoanalytic literature, postmodernism, that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. So two different uh, ones, right? And so uh, certainly my outlook is different because I see both positions as problematic. And with the stories that I try to tell is to basically show people that there are different ways to understand trauma. And some of the trauma are really sort of historically and culturally specific, right? For example, you know, because if you look at the Freudian sort of tradition of psychoanalysis, it's always very individual. It's always about individual subjectivity. It's about, uh, this is why the loss of memory is such such a big thing so, because loss of memory for individual is the loss of the faculty to remember. You, you lose who you are as an individual, right? But for a Chinese population, you know, living in the 20th century, you know, losing, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't people who lost their memory, you know, because of extreme shock, right? I'm, I'm saying that, look, there are people who are, who remember, they're traumatized too. Because for that position, if you if you can remember, you're not traumatized. I think I think that's an that's that's an absolute bollock <laughs> position. Uh, and like I said, but that's that's been a very dominant school psychoanalysis, right? So you you got to basically get that memory out, get that memory out, because you can't remember, right? You got to use hypnotize that person to get that memory out. And once you recover that traumatic memory, you can cure this person, right? And if you use that as a historical analogy, as a historian, if we sort of recover the suppressed past, we can deal with it. But I think it's much, it's really much more than that. It is really, really, really much more. And, and for, like I said, for a Chinese population living at a time, losing, you know, one's memory is not, is not as traumatic as losing the ability to go home to basically, we're, we're, we're one day away from Chinese New Year's Eve, right? So this is still going on, going home to spend time with your family. And maybe when you die to be buried with your ancestors, that's very important for Chinese who live at a time. And once you found out you cannot do that, that's extremely traumatic for a person and it's very traumatic for that person's identity. And right, and so the question is then how salient is this identity? I don't know which identity that you, sorry for, are you, are you talking, if you're talking about mainlander identity, um, I would say that this, this identity, contemporary mainlander identity is not as salient as other ethnic identity, just by the simple fact that, you know, if you identify yourself as a mainlander, then you sometimes you take on this sort of burden of being a colonizer, right? So it's not as salient, but it's it's there. It is there. Um, sorry, Dr. Peterson, you have something that you want to sort of, is, are, we, are we over time now? <laughs> We've not only run out of time, but we're slightly over time. So okay. um, I think we should probably uh, um, call it uh, a day. Some people may have other obligations. Um, I don't know. I think it's being recorded. So I think you might have the option of replying and writing to some of the, there's about seven questions left, should you, should you wish to do so. But maybe Lisa could go could yes. go over that. Yeah, I, I would do that. I will respond to every one of the questions. Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, let me then uh, thank uh, our audience and uh, thank our uh, three panelists. And most of all, uh, thanks to Dominic for a uh, terrific uh, hour and a half here. Thanks to everyone. And we'll now sign off. Bye bye. Right. Um, bye. Oh, bye. happy Chinese New Year for bye. our Hula New Year for everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. And Malin, I, I'll, I'll see you next week. We're going to do another no, round. No, Friday. Right? Friday. Friday. Yeah. yeah Friday. Friday. So next Friday. Yes. Let's repeat. Okay. 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 Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye, Lisa. Bye, Lisa.